Good afternoon. Um, today we're going to speak about a book by uh, David Carrasco. The name of the book is Religions of Mesoamerica. In Mesoamerica, we find a culture that has a different understanding of space, time, the cosmos, social and economic relations, and the underworld. Mesoamerica was one of the seven places of the globe, together with Nigeria, India, China, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Peru, where human culture managed the great transformation from, from uh, pre-urban society to urban society. All these urban societies had distinctive characteristics. They all developed some sort of art, symbolism, politics, and social organization that became the heart and nexus of human culture. These primary urban societies were organized by monumental ceremonial centers that contain such architectural structures as temples, platform mounds, pyramids, palaces, terraces, staircases, court stelae, and spacious ritual precincts. Mesoamerican history goes around those ceremonial centers and their cosmological, astronomical, and social meanings. A lot of those ceremonial centers were located in towns visited by pilgrimage. This is the case of Teotihuacan, also called the About of the Gods, or Xochilcalco, called the Place of the House of Flowers, uh, Chichen Itza, also called the mouth of the well of the, it of the Itza, Coloacan, also called the place of the ancestors, Toyan or Tula, called the place of the reeds, or Teocoloacan, called also the place of the divine ancestors. All those places had been pilgrimage towns visited during pre-Columbian times very important towns in the region. The ceremonial, sorry, the ceremonial presence of Mesoamerica uh, were centers and theaters for the acting out of religious and social life. They attracted people, goods, authority, and sacred forces into their presence ceremonials and marketplaces. Once within the power, drama and order of the ceremonial center, people and their goods underwent experiences that changed them and their sense of orientation and value. Moreover, ceremonial centers projected a centrifugal force, redistributing goods, values and people outward into the society at large. Is a little bit like banks now um, in, in their importance within the society, within the structure of the community. In this article, we will speak about the concept of cosmovision, defined as the ways in which Mesoamericans combine their cosmological notions relating to time and space into a structured and systematic worldview. Their cosmovision had a strong sense of parallelism of macrocosms, like the celestial supernatural forces of the cosmos, and the microcosm, the biological human patterns of life on Earth. We find parallels of time and space of deities and the ones of humans and terrestrial beings. In fact, time and space were inseparable realities. If we look at the chronology uh, of pre-Columbian Mesoamerica, we're going to start at the year 1500 BC, uh, which is when the rise of Olmec civilization uh, appears uh, with monumental architecture and a superb sculptural tradition in gigantic basal monuments and miniature yate work. 
we find in Olmec era a hybrid art style of animal and human form, characteristic of shamanic specialists. This, as I said, started around the year 1500 and uh, it was between that year and the 900 BC. Uh, between 900 and 300 BC, we have the fluorescence of uh, Olmec cosmovision and ceremonial style with a proliferation of religious cults dedicated to gods of rain, fire, maize, plumed serpent, the earth and the underworld. In between 600 and 300 BC, in Montalban, in Oaxaca, we find astronomical alignments of ceremonial buildings and elaborate public ceremonies and, ro and, ro uh, and royal tombs. There is a generalization of Mesoamerican cosmovision with the rise of Itzapan civilization in Chiapas, where we find pyramidal mounds, upright stelae, lock, long count, calendar dates and writing. In between 300 and 100 BC, we have the early Maya. And between 200 and 900 C, uh, AD, we have the rise of Teotihuacan, Monte Alban in Oaxaca, and Maya culture in the lowland Maya. In between 100 and 700 AD, we have uh, Teotihuacan, a power a city uh, influencing the whole region and the spread of uh, its cosmovision with the cult of the rain, of war, jowers, feather serpent and stars the, the developing. In between, in between 300 and 900 AD, we have uh, the Mayan cosmovision with long count calendar, intense presentation of royal families, complex writing system. With this culture, we find the cosmic tree, cosmovision, dynastic records, journey through Shibalba or the underworld, and auto sacrifice and human sacrifice. All those characteristics of Mayan culture. Between the year 900 and 1500 AD, we have the rise of the Toltec Empire with Toyan as the main city influencing the, the region and Mesoamerica in general and the development of the Aztec world. In between the year 900 and 1100 AD, we have uh, the Toltec Tula and of, Quetz of Quetzalcoatl tradition. During this period, we find warrior cults, long distance trading, origination and perfection of arts, and a cosmovision that influenced others as Chichen Itza, for example. Between the, one, the, the 1200s and 1350 AD, we have the lake culture of the Central Plateau uh, with the Chichimex or Aztecs, uh, a place where uh, it, you know, it was built, uh, the, the big Aztec city of Tenochtitlan. In the year 1325 AD, it is the time of Tenochtitlan and its deity Huitzilopochtli in the form of an eagle. This site was divided in four. At the Great Temple, we find a combination of two cults, the cult of Taloc, god of agriculture and water, and the cult of Huitzilopochtli, god of war and tribute. In the year 1350 AD, we have in the island of Tlatelolco, the market center for the lake cultures, really important markets uh, in those cultures. And nowadays, if you visit me Mexico or Guatemala, for example. In between the year 1425 and 1468 AD, we have the union in Tenochtitlan of the Triple Alliance, with the Aztecs, Tlacopan, and Texcoco, Texcoco, sorry. In between the year 1440 and the year 1468 AD, we have 
Coatepe Temple expanding with a city that reaches 200,000 people. It was a time when probably in Europe there were not many, if so, uh, cities of this size. In the year 1473 uh, AD, the Aztecs of Tenochtitlan imposed their rule over market system of Tlatelolco. So we're moving to the next next slide. Um, sacred ceremonial presents were the earliest and most influential institutions contributing to the organization of peoples into urban centers. These sacred ceremonial centers were so important that we have the need to approach the study of Mesoamerican religions through the continuous patterns and presence for cosmovision and ritual action created and celebrated within those presence and their city-states within those uh, temples. Um, the crash of Mesoamerican and European culture, uh, you know, at the arrival of the Spaniards into uh, America, resulted on the creation of inventions and fantasies by the Europeans about the geography and about the nature of human beings as well. The beginning Mesoamerica was seen as an earthly paradise. Europeans hoped to have found, uh, you know, the Garden of Eden, the seven enchanted cities of gold, or the mountain of Yoth. An example of that is Shakespeare's uh, The Templest and Thomas More's Utopia, uh, books written, you know, uh, at the time in, in Europe. The voyages of discovery brought a feeling of newness and at the same time of other, different, of people that had not progressed. All of this brought important questions into Europeans' mind, in Europeans' uh, citizens. What is a human being? What is the difference between a civilized and a barbaric language? Is Europe the center of the world? This also came from the landscape of the islands near Mexico and the beauty of the South American mainland, which stimulated the stories that the earthly paradise written uh, on the Bible and medieval books had finally been discovered. In central Mexico, these hopes took the form of a belief that a millennial kingdom ruled by priests who would uh, convert the masses of night natives into uh, Christians was about to be established. So it worked both sides. There was also a belief that St. Thomas was in Mexico. So it worked from the European uh, perspective, but also from the native uh, perspective in America. Natives were seen as souls to be saved in a global process of conversion. Um, you know, they were like intoxicated by... Uh, pagan thoughts, and they had to be converted uh, to save them, uh, to bring them to the reign of God, or the European God. Uh, you have this uh, um, dualistic approach of the novel savage and the wild man. Some Europeans thought of natives as wild humans with an evolution and development that had taken a very different direction. Some Europeans thought of them as savages, but also that they did not suffer the debilitating effects of civilization associated with greed, cruelty, and bad manners. They were novel and pure, so it was, you know, there were different views uh, about, about them as, as, as a humans, human beings, what type of human beings were. A third group of Europeans looked at the new world, which was complex and demanded analysis. All of this created obviously lots of prejudices. These debates in Spain and in the new world during the 16th century took place long before the settlements of the New England colonies in North America. The categories, prejudices and cliches about Mesoamerican people were often the basis for the attitudes and policies of discrimination later developed towards American Indians in North America. After arrival, you know, after years of uh, Spanish, uh, Spanish arrival, uh, people like, for example, Bartolomeo de las Casas 
brought the conversion to Christianity initiative to turn the natives into humans and without the use of violence, uh, what uh, did not happen at the beginning. Um, we find uh, two controversies uh, related with uh, Mesoamerica. Um, Mesoamerican religions were animated in part by ritual bloodletting and the sacrifice of human beings, who were rituals transformed into deities. That was the one of the uh, thoughts, you know, like what the beliefs behind this human sacrifice and ritual bloodletting. Europeans did not understand that this was the reason behind human sacrifices, did not understand the meanings of those uh, ceremonies, rituals and actions. Another controversy is whether the Aztecs attain a level of social and symbolic complexity associated with urban civilizations. Some apply Darwin evolutionary theory to society saying that natives hadn't reached the third final stage. I mean, this is, uh, you know, this is obviously an European view based on the philosophy uh, of the time, you know, like uh, this evolutionary theory of uh, humans that had to go one way and, you know, the, the path followed by European uh, society, European, you know, communities, it was the, the path to be followed by any any community around the world. Um, we, you know, if you're looking at the literary sources, and there are seven main literary sources. Uh, first one is also obviously the Popol Vuh uh, of, the, of the Mayas, you know, the, the Book of Creation. Then you have Landa's uh, Relación de las Cosas de Yucatán, that was uh, Spanish also, so that was the name in Spanish. Then you have the Book of Chilam Balam of Tizimin. The Anales do Cuatitlan, La Leyenda de los Soles, Codex Cantares eh, Mexicanos, and a Florentine Codex. In a passage about uh, Ometeol, the Duality God, we see the organization of the cosmos into 13 levels and the division of the cosmos into a dual supernatural reality, male and female, which gives light and understanding to the world. The Popol Vuh introduces to us the concept of sowing and doning, that is, planting and harvesting, but also burial and rebirth, and also sunset and sunrise. Planting and rebirth, so vital to uh, Maya uh, mentality, agricultural uh, community by large was also expressed in periodic rebirth of the cosmos, which passed through stages. So, again, like many other uh, native societies, we have agriculture connected to, you know, cycles of life, uh, connected to, you know, human, re you know, human life and death cycles is all, co is all connected. In most parts uh, of Mesoamerica, we have war and the aesthetic ritual character of the warrior was overly religious and was all guided by a cosmovision saturated with military motives. These are characteristics of Mesoamerica. They took great care uh, to regulate through art and aesthetic expression, the profound, the profound transformation a human being underwent in training, costuming, combat, uh, victory, defeat, sacrifice, and the afterlife. An example of that is a god with, with Philopocli, a mother warrior who set man's heart on fire and gave them courage for war. The Florentine Codex uh, from Bernardino, Bernardino de Saum is perhaps the richest resource for the study of Mesoamerican religions. In there, you, you, know, you find, uh, for example, the goddess Shilonen, described as a living symbol of fertility and powerful objects, obsidian, mostly, that, like coal, come out of the earth. So you have, you know, 
which I just mentioned about birth and rebirth and death, you know, and also connected to objects, not just to living creatures or living, uh, you know, plants. Uh, it was a bit also connected to, you know, to rocks, and to stones. Mesoamericans conceived of time and space as thoroughly intertwined. It was the function of ritual life act out in the ceremonial centers to regulate and restore the detailed interactions of spatial, dire spatial directions, colors, and times with time periods, anniversaries, births, deaths, journeys, ancestors, and war. So you have connection of space and time and ceremonial centers as key uh, places to uh, through ritual and ceremony to uh, maintain and to rebuild rebirth bring to rebirth all, all those spaces and times the cosmological genealogical ritual and historical information was communicated to the community by a combination of pictorial signs and oral interpreters who use images as the basis for verbal presentation. You have a specialist working on that cosmology, on the interpretation of, a, of this astronomy. We find a Mesoamerican obsession with the cycles of agriculture, the stars and the forces and meaning of sacred time and sacred space, sacred place. Time was closely observed and each day was considered loaded with celestial and divine influences that determine the inner character and destiny of a person and the actions carried out at the specific times. What was the social and religious character of these major periods of cultural integration in Mesoamerica? It is very important to understand. There are three concepts that are really important to understand. The first one is wall making. Society is organized around ceremonial centers modeled on a vision of the structure of the universe. The chief has a ceremonial present with monumental architecture that served as the ritual theater for acting out the ways in which the world was made and would be remade. Ceremonial center is the pivot of the universe, attracting humans, gods, everything, as it was a magnet. The ceremonial center is an axis mundi, is the center of the world. Then you have the concept of wall centering, which means the cultural wall was made and ordered at the ceremonial centers through the creative work of human beings. Human beings act as the centering agents of cultural and religious life in two decisive ways, in two different ways. The human body is the nexus and unifying structure of the universe. And the second, a world centered accomplished through the work of sacred specialists and royal lineages. It is through sacrifice of extraordinary beings that the world becomes centered and regular as the sun moves along its path, dividing time into night and day. This is two of the main concepts. Um, the third one is about world renewal. Entire, which means, yeah, an entire style of life organized by a world view emphasizing the daily, monthly, and yearly rejuvenation of society and the cosmos. Rejuvenation depended on rituals, performances that replay the myths and images of the origins and the transformations of the cosmos. So all these rituals and ceremonies, they are just recreating the acts of primal of the primal times when the world was created we find a new we find new rituals to respond to ecological social and economical changes and crises also we find priests 
using complex calendar systems, divination, and stargazing to direct public rituals to communicate the structure and dynamics of the universe. There is a tight system of ritual displays with pilgrimages, dances, songs, combat, sacrifices and coronations to renew the world. Just as the cosmos was made with the sunrise and centered with the sun path through sacrifice, so it is renewed through daily, weekly, monthly and yearly sacrifices of different kinds. So that's the interpretation of, for example, the sun, you know, like sunrise, you know, and the sun goes to along the path and sunsets. So you have, you know, you need to bring the sun back. You need to, uh, you know, re renew that and uh, you go in through like sacrifices to bring that uh, star back again um, into like human eyes. In many ways, Mesoamerica is the most different of the world's early civilizations. Um, that's what David Carrasco said. Maybe it's don't know if I agree with this uh, you know, statement of his, but it was definitely different from other civilizations. Um, it arose in a land where communication was exceptionally difficult and natural disaster was frequent. Its occupants had a wealth of uh, domestic plants, but few domestic animals. This meant that not only economics, but also the metaphors of daily life or of religion and politics were different from those of other civilization. civilizations. Uh, just to give you an example of the differences, in Mesoamerica there cannot be a, a bull of heaven or a lamp of God uh, because of what I just mentioned. Uh, they didn't domesticate animals. Um, for all these reasons, Mesoamerica is a critical case for developing and evaluating general ideas about worldview as a context for understanding the developing cultural complexity and for the importance of what we term religion in the rise of the first hierarchical polities. Because it's different from others, so it is interesting to see how they interpret the world, uh, you know, how the human mind works in a place which is different from, for example, uh, you know, ancient Europe. Um, you know, their understanding of plants and the sacred dead, for example. Uh, on one side, there were early migrations uh, coming through the Strait of Bering. Or oh, that's that's the, well, the that's one of the theories. Uh, the natives uh, crossed from Asia to America through the Strait of Bering. Uh, who entered the uh, American continent, continent and carried a circumpolar and circumboreal hunting culture, which included shamanism and ceremonial ties to animals and their spirits. This, uh, this influenced greatly the cultures of Mesoamerica. Natives uh, compared the creation of human beings with the creation of corn. Plants were domesticated, corn, beans, squash, avocados, cotton, chilies. All these plants were perce perceived as imbued with sacred powers and came to play important roles in the mythology, calendar, ritual, costumes, ancestor worship and performances of Mesoamerican religions. So the plant world was a key, was a really important, essential for them. During the last part uh, of the formative period uh, in in this region, these agricultural cyclic periods resulted on people developing some of the ritual relationships uh, to the human body that eventually became central to the religious religions of Mesoamerica. Shamanism, uh, special offerings to, uh, to the dead, the dismemberment of uh, human beings, sacrifice and cremation, you know, all these like characteristic uh, activities uh, were greatly influenced uh, by these agricultural cyclic periods uh, and, you know, natives' interpretation of them. Between the, the year 1800 uh, 
BC and the year 200 AD. Cultures began to form permanent ceremonial centers containing impressive monumental and ceremonial architecture. Within the centers, uh, ritual performances were act out and directed by priestly uh, elites who managed the integration of economic, political, artistic, astronomical and spiritual forces. Important private and public ceremonies of ritual bloodletting uh, were carried out in which priests drew blood from tongues, ear, earlobes, fists and sexual organs using fish spines and uh, all other uh, sharp objects. There was a shared cosmovision influencing ceremonial architecture and ritual. The combination of ceremonial centers the microcosm and uh, the astronomical events, the macrocosm, is what helps create order in the world. That's what they believe. Connection between astronomy and life on Earth. Um, religious ideas and symbols were not only mental activities, but rather tied up with daily work, trade, social order and warfare. In addition to the important task of, of interpreting oral traditions, we are often faced with new texts, like stones, sacred stones, ceremonial architecture, pottery, human and animal bones. Um, Olmecs, uh, which is uh, the first culture that we, the great culture that influenced uh, in Mesoamerican society, uh, they were recognized, uh, well, they, were, they were located uh, in Veracruz and Tabasco regions and had great influence uh, on posterior cultures. Uh, they were recognized as people from the land of the rubber trees because of the trees that were found on the area. They use uh, jade, basalt, clay and the earth itself in the form of caves, hills and artificial volcanoes. In the caves, we find paintings and rituals of mythic events. In cliffs, we find carvings of human-animal spirit relations. It is typical of Olmec culture, a tie to the earth reflected in Olmec mythology expressing themes of emergence from caves, human jaguar transformation and the relations of animals to rulers. The Olmecs basically set in motion certain religious patterns that were elaborated and developed by later peoples. They had a tradition of stone carving, rock painting, and religious imagery. Olmec artistic and conceptual style spread far and wide. This included the ritual calendar and ritual burials, and a profound relationship with animals whose uh, visages permeate uh, their art. We find during this era, ceremonial centers ornamented with fantastic religious motifs depicting animal-human relations. We, find, we also find carefully and beautifully curved stones reflecting the belief in spirit helpers who took the form of powerful, aggressive, even dangerous animals serving in the practice of shamans. Real or fantastic or entities became intimately associated with all individuals. They could function as the spiritual guides of sacred specialists, warriors, priests, and the ruling class. Gigantic Olmec faces reflecting artistic sophistication, both a complex level of social organization and a deep concern for religious symbolism were found at the time. A preoccupation of the relation between certain human groups and the Axis Mundi started up with the Olmecs. This combination of human and temple at the heart of a settlement indicates the early pattern of what we have called wall centering. We have this special relationship of sac sacred, play sacred space, ceremonial structures, the earth, the dead and the underworld. The post-Olmec invention of a ritual calendar of extraordinary accuracy 
who was believed that the Oneg invented the great calendar of the long count. So it is believed that they were the first ones uh, to, you know, to work on, on such a calendar. Then we have the ball game. The ball game uh, was very important in Mesoamerica. Um, ball, uh, the ball game court uh, was a, ma a major cosmic symbol on the shape of an I, uh, capital I, which you know represented a four-quartered universe joined by the central or fifth region, no, the underworld. The court and the game constituted a cosmogram, an image of the cosmos, and a religious drama. In Aztec times, it appears that the playing court represented the narrow passage way of the underworld through which the sun traveled at night. The game represented a cosmic struggle between competing factions to see which group could bring the sun out of the underworld by hitting the ball through one of the two perforated rings on the sides of the court. The ball court symbolized a temple in which solar drama was acted out in human time and space. The sacrifice of the losing player may represent the offering of energy in the form of blood and human life in order to give birth to the new sun. In Oaxaca, important religious innovations, astronomical alignments and pictorial narratives took place. In Monte Alban, it is found an alignment of buildings with particular astronomical events plus the relationship, sorry, plus the appearance of writing and the elaboration of the long count calendar system. From this, we connect the relationship of the orientation of ceremonial buildings to astronomical events such as the solstices, equinoxes, and Venus cycles being of major importance in our understanding of the cosmo, of cosmovision. Human and cultural spaces had to be in tune or aligned with celestial bodies and their patterns. We will see that in Mayan culture, we will see that in Teotihuacan, we see that in Teotihuacan, in Aztec uh, culture. So like referring now to classic Maya, uh, you know, we, we find in, in Mayan culture, we find a mathematical, mathematically ingenious calendar. We find also lavishly decorated ceremonial centers, a heightened conception of the royal person, writing, complex mythology of the underworld and cosmic regeneration. As a means of recording important human events and attuning human order, the Maya developed different calendars. We have the 260 days calendar called Tetzolkin. Then we have the 365 days uh, solar, can uh, solar count calendar, which is the HAP. Then we have the long count calendar. It's a calendar that counts like a uh, huge uh, uh, time, uh, ta ta a huge time frame. And there are others. The Maya belief the world was centered by a combination of the sacred flowering cosmic tree and the royal person, both linked to the world of ancestors. That's key to Maya culture. You know, uh, the cosmic tree, uh, the dynasty, and uh, the ancestors, the dead. Teotihuacan, uh, also like well, or the imperial capital, really important for Mesoamerican culture. Teotihuacan was defined as the place where one becomes deified. It was designed as a gigantic image of the cosmos. It originated at the mouth of a well under the pyramid of the sun, where it lie the remains of an ancient tunnel and shrine area, which perhaps was a pilgrimage uh, arrival point. Caves were valued as places of origins of ancestral peoples and the openings to powers and gods of the underworld. The cave was decorated as a four-petal flower 
representing the division of space into four cardinal regions around the center. Caves were seen as the earliest imago mundi, or sacred images of the cosmos. Teotihuacan itself was split in four quadrants by two big avenues, and it was representing the cosmos. The layout of the town had clear linkages to astronomical events, the great stairway, stairway to, the, to the pyramid of the sun, for example, faces a westerly point to the horizon where the plates sat directly in front of it. So again, ceremonial center uh, or architecture uh, connected to astronomy. There was a novel attempt to achieve a harmony and to express the harmony publicly between the Great Pyramid and the Celestial Patterns. As an example, we have the Pleiades, which made its first yearly appearance above the horizon before the sun rose on the day it passed through the zenith. It is likely that these two stellar events key to the cosmovision of so many Mesoamerican cultures, signal the moment when the elites organize the masses of people to ritually prepare for the new agricultural reason, uh, agricultural season. There were many, they had many, they, were, they had hundreds of deities. Um, and perhaps some of the most important were obviously Quetzalcoatl, the feather serpent, Ometeol, which was the dual god, and then you have Tlaloc, the rain god, Shipetotec, the god of vegetation, or the goddess of sexuality called Xochiquetzal. Teotihuacan was in fact seen as the place of origin by posterior cultures, as the origin of the fifth age of the cosmos in the, in the Aztec empire. So the fifth age it was believed that was started by gods, in Teotihuacan. So, really important, essential for the culture, Mesoamerican culture. Toyan eh, or Tula was also the capital center of a great civilization, which was the Toltec culture. Eh, Toyan meant a uh, place of the re place of reeds, and it was ruled by the well, at some point it was ruled by the priest king. Topilthin Quetzalcoatl, a devotee of the great god Quetzalcoatl. Toyan existed on a golden age where agricultural abundance, technological excellence, artistic perfection and, as, and a spiritual genius were united under Quetzalcoatl. Toltecs thought as very wise. They were thought, you know, uh, posterior cultures have, uh, you know, they had them as a genius culturally and uh, with economical stability. In fact, we find a statement by the Aztecs who said, truly with him it began, truly from him it flowed out, from Quetzalcoatl, all art and knowledge. There are two Quetzalcoatl figures. The first one is one of the four sons of Meteol, o Meteol a god who dwelt in the innermost of the heaven. Quetzalcoatl created the cosmos, recovered ancestral bones from the underworld, from Mictlan, that was how it was called in Toltec and uh, Aztec, Aztec culture, and acquired corn from the mountain of sustenance for humans, so of great importance. Um, then we have the human representative of Quetzalcoatl, a man god who ruled Toyan and brought it to its apex of greatness. Topilthin Quetzalcoatl, as he is called, apparently changed the ritual tradition of sacrificing human beings. This eventually provoked magical attacks to, uh, of his arch rival Tezcatlipoca, Lord of the Smoky Mirror, whose sacrificial cults brought uh, Quetzalcoatl into exile. The Aztecs, of the Aztec culture. There, the precursors were, uh, the Aztecs precursors were the Chichimex, uh, or they also called Dog lineage. They migrated to the lake region, formed by five interconnected lakes. One of its groups, the Mexicas, 
established themselves on a swampy island in the middle of the lakes and organized a ferocious political and military unit with the capacity of dominating by force and persuasion an increasing number of city-states. With the support of Chalocan and Texcoco, former uh, Triple Alliance, I just mentioned in the chronology about this, they eventually assume power. We find with the Aztec culture and religion, we find, uh, warfare, the concentration of order within the capital of Tenochtitlan, a fear of cosmic instability and a connection to the intentions of the gods. In Aztec cosmovision, the cosmic setting was dynamic, unstable and destructive, distinguished by sharp alternations between order and disorder, cosmic life and cosmic death. Cosmic order was marked by combats, sacrifice and rebellion, as well as by harmony, cooperation and stability. The negative, uh, the negative seemed, though, to overcome the positive. The myth of the sons of Aztec calendar is a great example, which depicts the four sons, or four ages, which passed prior the fifth uh, current age. The first age, called Sun for Ta Ta uh, Tiger, was brought into order out of primordial chaos. A struggle between gods resulted in a collapse of the cosmos and then reorganization by Tezcatlipoca. The beings that lived this age were eaten by ocelots. The second age, or Sun for Wind, beings were taken by the wind. The third age, called Sun for Rain, fire rained on people, fire rained on people and became and people became Tarkis. The fourth age, uh, called Sun for Water, water swallowed people and they became fish. And the fifth age was created in Teotihuacan out of sacrifice by lots of deities. You see it on the myths, you know, human sacrifices, God sacrificing. You see, you know, like it is in their mythical stories. Cosmic order was achieved in the Aztec universe out of the conflict, sacrifice and the death of humans and gods. The Aztecs controlled trade routes, had an aggressive cosmovision and large-scale military campaigns that were celebrated with rituals. The purpose was to acquire the divine forces embedded in the physiology of human beings in order to nourish the sun, earth and rain, so that the stability of the fifth age would be maintained. It's a threat that that age will come to an end. The rituals involve ritual preparation, ceremonial sacrifice, and acts of nourishing the gods and the community. Its capital, Tenochtitlan, was a four-quartered city inspired by a cosmovision with several distinctive qualities. Each of the each of the 18, 20 days, months, because the, the calendar had 18 months and there were 20 days each, involved public sacrifices of captured warriors or, in rare cases, children and, uh, and women. We're not... They were not the norm, though. War was the place where Jawa roar and death in the battlefield was the flowery death. The leaders, as Moctezuma, were warriors, priests and artists at the same time. They led battles to obtain tributary payments of foods, luxuries, feathers, servants and captured warriors in order to keep the capital rich and publicly, publicly triumphant, the foundation of heaven. 
there were also poets and philosophers in the Aztec Empire, the Tlamatinime, who elaborated a critique against the spiritual crisis caused by the dominant cosmovision of conflict and warfare. These wise men argued that the place of duality or Omeyokan, innermost past part of heaven, on the 13th heaven, could be known through the creation of true words or supreme poems or as aesthetic words or supreme poems of, you know, like with beautiful language. This way, the heart became deified and united with the gods in a spiritual sense. An example is the wise man of Texcoco, Nezahualcoyotl, which he was believed to be one of these Tlalamatinime. Mesoamerican, if we look at the Mesoamerican cosmovision and the structure of the cosmos, we have an overworld or celestial place which was 13 layers, and on top of it we find Ometeol. Then we have a middle world, or earthly level, where human beings lived, human beings lived. and then we had an underworld, or Midland, which had nine layers. Each level was permeated with supernatural powers, calculated, calculating up and down the cosmic levels through a spiral-shaped passages called Malikalis. The places from which wealth derives, fountains, forests, mines, are thought to be points of communication between the walls of men and that of death, guarded by the Oikan Chaneke, lords of the dangerous places. Supernatural entities and forces flowing into the human level through seiva trees, which held up the sky at the, at the four quarters and stood at the center of the universe. Supernatural forces from below and above could also enter the world through caves, fire, sunlight, animals, stones, any place where there was a spiral or opening connecting humans with the spaces or temporal cycles of the gods. The pyramids, the, pyram the pyramids, sorry, the pyramids of great temples as cosmic, cosmic mountains, axis, axis mundi, connecting the sun, stars, and celestial influences to the earth. These structures were also openings to the underworld at times had caves or, open, or openings to access subterranean forces. If we're talking about the cosmovision and the human being, we find that the human body and the career of a human being was at the center. We had three levels. We had the head, was the heavenly water, then we have the heart as the lower heavens and the liver as a spirit, uh, the spiritual underworld. The human body is the nucleus and unifying body of the cosmos, permeated with a specific supernatural powers and entities. The human body was progressively filled with powers originating in the celestial spaces above and in the and in sacred events that took place in mythical times. Even though these special powers were filled or loaded in the whole body, were found especially on the head, which also it was, it was believed that you could find there the tonagi, the animating force or soul that provided vigor and the energy for growth and development, and then the heart, which received the teolia, which gave life to people, providing emotion, memory, and knowledge. The teolia was the soul that could live after the body. The liver received iviyotl, which brought the bravery, desire, hatred, love, and happiness. 
These forces gave character and directed the physiological process of the human body. Every human being was seen as the living center of these forces. Some humans could have moments contain more extraordinary supernatural forces, and some human beings they had like a bigger capacity to have those supernatural forces, like for example priests or you know kings. Time, the cosmovision of time. Time was believed to exist in three different planes, each intersecting with one another. The meeting of human time with the time of the gods and the time before the gods filled human life with incredible power, changes and significance. Human beings dwelt in a time or cycle of time created on the surface of the earth by the gods. It was marked by the calendar, Time and space were seen as interwine, as an interwine sacred entity. The passage of time was created by supernatural forces that emanated from the sky and the underworld and converged on the earthly level. Then there was a prior time, the time of myth, when gods had undergone struggles, abductions, broken honor, death and dismemberment. During this time, supernatural beings were created. This time continued to the present time. Beyond these two times and touching them was the third temporal time, the third temporal realm, the transcendent time of the gods. The high gods existed a priori and provided the original energy and structure of the universe. This primordial time, when order was created from chaos, continues on in a celestial realm. We find human time within mythic time and within primordial time. Human life, time and space, is loaded up with a specific set of powers and entities each day. Within these complicated formulas of time was a profa profound commitment and concern for ensuring the renewal of cosmic forces alive in plants, animals, humans and dynasties. In Yaxilan, for example, in Chiapas, through a ritual sacrifice, two realms of time, the time of the gods and the time of the humans, all linked together and renewed. Mesoamerican calendars marked and regulated the passage of influences into human life. One of the great measuring devices of these calendars were astronomical observations, which guided a number of major ceremonies related to Venus, the Pleiades, and changes in the solar cycle. If we look at uh, the Aztecs and the religion of the Aztecs, uh, first of all, um, we need to say that during the Toltec, uh, Toltec culture and afterwards, the Aztec Empire, we find uh, Quetzalcoatl as the life of the priest. Topilchin Quetzalcoatl was the model priest king who had ruled the great 11th century Toltec kingdom of Toyan before he was forced into exile, promising to return one day. The Aztec cosmovision was based on the Toltec cosmovision, in which there was an important relationship between the great god Quetzalcoatl and the hombre dios Topilchin Quetzalcoatl. The Aztec shape of time and ceremonial renewal which provided, uh, provided the framework for ritual sacrifice, uh, including human sacrifice, and was were greatly influenced by Toltec tradition. In fact, you know, it is believed that, uh, you know, within the mythical stories, uh, Quetzalcoatl uh, returned in the year 1519 AD which was the year of Cortes' arrival, uh, of Spanish arrival, into, uh, 
into Mesoamerica. Topil Quetzalcoatl played a major pattern in wall centering. Topilchin, uh, well, there are stories of myths about Topilchin Quetzalcoatl, uh, Karian, and his relationship with his powerful divinity. Divine forces, originating in other levels of the cosmos, enter the world through his life and through his religious experiences. He had a miraculous birth, ritual training and ecstatic experiences, an accession to us. He, he ascended into the throne, to, to, uh, ascended to the throne. Uh, he created a splendid capital. It was a downfall at the hands of his rival, Tezcat Lipoca. There was exile. And there was also death and transformation into Venus as the morning star, a divinity. So he became a deity. He was born from ingestion to, of his mother Chimalma, meaning earth shield, of an emerald. He was raised by grandparents and underwent seven years of rigorous ritual training, living for a time as a mountain ascetic. He practiced auto-sacrifice techniques and, uh, that were at once offerings to the gods and openings into the human body designed to enhance direct communication with the deities. All the rituals at the temples of the Aztecs imitated him. He was successful in communicating and having direct experience of Ometeol, the creative heavenly pair who dwelt in the innermost part of heaven, at the top of the celestial levels. Techniques used by Topilcin Quetzalcoatl were humble prayers, auto-sacrifice, bathing in cold water and speaking in metaphors of duality, which helped him to reach Omeyokan, the house of uh, Ometeol. He is also a model warrior and sacrificer. He was born in a world of war. The gods were periodically at war with one another during mythic times. The gods created the Chichimex in order to gain sacrificial blood through human warfare and the ritual sacrifice of captives. Topilthin was trained for seven years in wars. He attacked enemies and performed human sacrifices at mountain shrines, which became a model of the Aztecs. But then Topilthin seems to ban human sacrifice. Tezcatlipoca takes advantage of this turn to trick him, who now became the wise king of Toyan, but was drunken and he violated his priestly vows and, for, and was forced to abdicate and into exile. There is the tension uh, sacrificing versus other modes of communication with deities, which, uh, you know, it continued during Aztec times. Um, we're talking about this excellent ecological complex of Tula uh, with uh, technological and artistic excellent achievements. Toltecs were the finest feather workers, were, were believed to be the finest feather workers, physicians, jewelers, uh, astronomers, architects. Ritual building constructed to face the cardinal directions, all of that are characteristics of Tula. Decayed, a decay culture, it was a decay culture when the priest king went into exile. So it is connected the fall of Toltec and civilization with the exile of uh, Topilcin Quetzalcoatl. The death and, deifi and deification of the human body. Uh, it was believed in Aztec thought about the sacrality of the human body and its potential to return its energy to the celestial forces that created it. It was widely believed that at death, energies within the human body, especially the teolia, contained in the human heart, could become deified or grafted onto the celestial substance of a divinity. And as, as an example, we find Topithin's teolia, which became Venus in its appearance as morning star. 
So we get into understand more about human sacrifice, the importance of the heart, you know, it's like a, it's got the, the, an energy, an energy can become divine. Um, cosmovision and the human body, the, 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 the connection of cosmovision and the human body. The history of religion show us that at one time or another, almost everything has been considered sacred. As a matter of fact, the human body is understood as a sacred container of cosmic forces. Example is the body and blood of Jesus ingested by us, or bodily remains of uh, Shakyamuni Buddha, uh, believed to be deposited in stupas or stone monuments after Buddha's death. And those stupas became objects of divine pilgrimage. Another example is the cults of mummies in ancient Egypt and in South America. Aztecs people saw the human organism as the container par excellence of sacred powers and rhythms. The human physique was treated as an extremely potent living image of cosmic forces. Mesoamerican religions are most vividly expressed in ceremonial centers. As I said uh, before, the most, pervasive, perv uh, the most pervasive type of sacred space where ceremonies uh, were carried out was the human body. Human body is seen as the receptacle, recep receptacle, receptacle, sorry, receptacle of cosmological forces, a living, moving center of the world. In the Codex Feyerbari Maer, we find a drawing in which there are four quarters containing a sacred tree with a celestial bird. In the center, it is Shiutekutli, the fire god dressed as warrior. In the drawing is represented the body of Tezcatlipoca, cut into pieces and divided over the four quarters, over the four directions of the world. His blood flows into the center, divine blood flowing into the axis of the universe, which redistributes the divine energy to animals, body parts, vegetation and the calendar, which is divided by the four quarters of the cosmos. This is a great example of Aztec cosmovision and the importance of blood flowing, representing cos which represents cosmic energy going through the whole universe. The gods Supernatural beings and forces inhabiting, they inhabit each layer, each of the 13 celestial layers and nine underworld layers. They inhabit all of them. Those forces enter in the earth through openings or avenues of communication, including four cosmic trees at the edges of the world, mountains, caves, rays of uh, sun, motion of the wind, different ways of entering, going through, into the earth. Lines of communication. Two pairs of hel heliacal bands, like the Malinali, in constant motion, allowing the forces of the underworld to, ans to ascend and the forces of the overworld to descend. These supernatural forces emerge each day from the sacred trees and spread across the landscape. They could be introduced into the human body by either ritual means or through the action of nature. In Aztec culture, we find the importance of two body parts, as I said before, the heart and the head, which channeled those supernatural forces. Hence the importance. The tonayi which is the powerful divine force which was collected in the, in the human head. The original source of Tonayi was Ometeol, the dual god. Tonayi reached the human through the action of celestial beings inhabiting other levels of the sky. We have the idea that Ometeol sends vital, for, vital energy into the uterus of uh, uterus of a for a human birth, which was deposited on the embryo's head, resulted on one's resulting on one's temperament and destiny. After birth, 
the baby was exposed to fire and to the sun in order to increase his or her tonaji. Sun was believed to be the most powerful visible source of tonaji. People could acquire tonaji from beans close to them after birth. Tonaji infiltrated on animals, plants, gods, humans and objects used in rituals. The hair of a human being was retaining lots of tonaji and prevented tonaji from living. Hair was precious because of that. The hair of warriors captured in battle was kept by the captors in order to increase their tonaji. The decapitated head of enemy warriors were a supreme prize for the city, which gained more tonaji through the ceremony. It is not surprising. The Teyolia, which was the divine force animating the human body and residing in the human heart, was likened to divine fire, animated the human body, gave shape to a person's sensibilities and thinking patterns. Every human being heart contained Teyolia, but priests, hombre dioses, artists, and men and women impersonating deities during festivals retain higher portion of Teolia. Each of these human be uh, types was considered a living channel of Teolia into the social world. You see, you see here like uh, hierarchical structures and their philosophical meaning. What's you know what's explaining those hierarchical structures? You know, Teolia is obviously one of the co philosophical concepts that explains it. When a person died, his or her Teolia traveled to the wall of the dead, to the sky of the sun, and there it was transformed into birds. When Topilthin died, Topilthin Ketsapkoal died. His Teoria rose to heaven and turned into a bird or divinity. Teoria was believed to be the power that gave energy to the sun, which was sought with human sacrifice. Teoria resided in mountains, lakes, towns and temples, in important landscapes and in living ent entities. Each community had an alte peyol kodl, or heart of the town, like a sculpture or decorated image. Few of them were found at the great temple of uh, Tenochtitlan. Then we have the Serpent Mountain, the great Aztec em, uh, em, uh, temple. Mesoamerican cosmos was centered in the physical characteristics of the human body. Each human being was a center of vital forces and changes. Each community had a public ceremonial presence, which oriented all human activity and influenced social life. Most powerful sacred place in the Aztec Empire was Coatepec, or Serpent Mountain, temple which was the temple of Tenochtitlan. It was the it was a it was a great temple connected to a sacred mountain. Mountains were seen as prodigious resources of for abundance, danger, sacrality, and power. The temple is in the center of the capital of an empire. The Templo Mayor supported the shrines of the great god Tlaloc, the god of the rain and agriculture, and Huitzilopochtli the god of tribute of war. This temple contained more than 100 rich catches of ritual offerings buried in its floors. So we have three important dimensions which were part of the great temple. The sacred mountain, the Aztec foundation, foundation myth, and the birth of war lord, Huitzilopochtli. Cosmovision and the Sacred uh, Mountain. We have a description 
of a desperate sacrifice of a number of fellow Spanish soldiers at the arrival of the Spaniards. That was described by one of the soldiers that uh, battled at Tenochtitlan uh, when, you know, Cortes men encountered um, in the battlefield uh, the Aztecs. There is a description of a Spanish, a Spanish soldier uh, of sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrificial ritual at the Great Pyramid. The Aztecs carried their work, uh, their word, Temanawak, land surrounded by water. That was their understanding. Land was surrounded by water. The four, four quadrants called Nau Champa. Four directions of the wind extending outward from the central section. East, which connects it to Tlacopan, place of dawn, yellow, fertile and good. We had the north, which was Mictlampa, the region of the underworld, red barren and uh, bad. Then we had the west, Tiwatlampa, region of women, blue, green and favorable and bad unfavorable and humid. We had the south called wheat lampa, region of thorns and white, and then we had the center, Tlal Chico, navel and black. The waters were surrounding waters uh, as we said we had waters surrounding merging with the sky and supported lower levels of heaven. Tenochtitlan was believed to be the quintessential connection point of the above and the below. The Aztec cosmovision connects points between the supernatural spheres and the human sphere. Mountains, sources of life-giving waters, deities and, de uh, deities and diseases associated with rain, the Tlalocs and other supernatural powers. The mountain of sustenance provides the resources for life. The mountains around the city were considered houses filled with water that came from subterranean streams that filled the space beneath the earth, not very far from the truth. This underworld realm was called Tlalocan, paradise of water deity Tlaloc. Mountain as axis mundi, linking the watery underworld and the terrestrial level of the city of the celestial realms. The great temple was pyramidal and supported two major shrines. The stairs led up to the shrines of Tlaloc and Huitzilopochtli. South side of temple was connected to Coatepel, the mountain birthplace of the war god Huitzilopochtli. The north side represented the mountain of susten the mountain of sustenance associated with Tlaloc's paradise, providing precious rains and moisture that regenerated the agricultural wall of the capital. The second dimension uh, that we mentioned was the myth of foundation. We have a symbolism of the center in two sacred stories, focusing on the wall-centering character. Tenochtitlan was seen as center of the wall. First image of the, the first image of the Codex Mendoza shows an eagle on top of nopal and stone above a giant Aztec shield, with seven eagle down feathers and seven arrows attached to it. The eagle was connected to the god with Lopotli, which was, as I said, the war and tribute god. These were the lands where the temple was built. That was the place where the Aztecs believed started the war, start, started the life. The city was a place of authority where all leaders of other regions slept for a time of for a time of the year. With Lopokli was a central force for the city's foundation in the making of his social and architectural world. He inspired the ancestors of the Aztecs to take the risky journey to find their distant home. With Lopokli set man's fire, man's heart 
on fire, preparing them for war, is very important for war, obviously. The myth of Huitlopochtli tells of his mom, Kuatlikue, giving birth from a bowl of plumage, and his baby fought all his family, decapitating her sister's head. His victory against his 400 siblings represents the sun's victory over the moon and the stars. Besides, the daily experience of nature is viewed in terms of a celestial conflict, war and sacrifice. The natural order is a violent order. The world is renewed through ritual combat at the sacred mountain. A third meaning is a crucial battle at a mountain called Coatepec, in which Huitzilopochtli killed a woman warrior named Koyolshaliki, and he decapitated her. Decapitated her. The Templo Mayor is an image of Coatepec, or Serpent Mountain, while the carving of the dismembered goddess was placed at the base of the stairway far below. After the dismemberment, Huitzilopochtli attacks the 400 siblings, drove them away, humbled them, sacrifices, starts at the sacred mountain. That's the meaning of what they do when their Spaniards are fighting them. This is the same sacrifices that had happened on this mythical time. Mythic action of sacrifice on the sacred mountain and elaboration of the sacrificial pattern in the early part of Topic Finketzatkoal's career became a model for sacrificing. The Spaniards sacrificed at the Great Temple at the Great Battle of Tenochtitlan recreated the attack by the 400 southerners at the Serpent Mountain, and as in the myth, they were sacrificed, dismembered, and thrown down the sacred steps in, uh, the sacred steps in order to give power to the Aztec age of the fifth sun. That's what we mentioned at the beginning. The Europeans couldn't understand that. When that Spanish soldier saw how the Aztecs, they were like sacrificing the soldiers. They were dismembering them into pieces and throwing them down the, sta the staircase of the temple. They couldn't understand what was that. I mean, they thought that they, they were just like, uh, you know, a different type of human being because they couldn't understand all this philosophy that they had behind, you know, that explained all the actions they did. We have a different, we have a different part of the Aztecs, which is also like really interesting, um, which is related to uh, sacred words, related to rhetorics, related to philosophy. In the Aztec culture, the rhetoricians were held in high regard. They were erected as high priests, lords, leaders, and captains. It would be wrong to picture Aztec society as violent and aggressive. Nahual-speaking people work in cooperation in farming communities, develop exquisite crafts and art forms, sponsor poetry festivals, care deeply for children, worried about the power of gossip, loved telling stories and had war markets. Urban society was full of beauty and order. Refined art of human speech was part of Aztec culture. Great effort into developing both eloquent speech forms and profound metaphorical content in their spoken interactions. In the book 6 um, of the Florentine Codex in Rhetoric and Moral Philosophy, it is presented the formal speeches and moral philosophy of the Aztecs. In there we find 40 prayers plus exhortations and orations spoken by parents, rulers, midwives and citizens, also riddles, proverbs and metaphors. The Tlama Timime, as I mentioned before, they were trained specialists who used the art of language to raise philosophical questions about human nature and its relations to ultimate truth. They searched for an alternative religious worldview than the mystic uh, military religion of the Aztec warrior, uh, warrior class. Training centers, which existed at the time, they were called Kalmecaks, 
where they preserve, honor traditions, produce and read the manuscripts and develop refined metaphors and poems to prove the true foundations of human existence. The Tlamatinime were poet philosophers. That's what they were. They saw human existence as fragile and ephemeral. The precious aspects of life, like jade, gold, flowers, paintings, were transitory and vulnerable rather than solid and with a firm foundation. Klamatinime's purpose was to experience the nature of truth, a solid foundation to existence, which could be reached through poetry, and the purpose was to penetrate celestial under and underworld layers to find a stable reality, to devise techniques to open the depths of the human personality to the wall of truth. The creation of flowers and songs and paintings that connected the human personality referred as face and heart with the divine. So you have flowers and songs, face and heart, and the reaching of the divine, which was the purpose of the, these, philosophers, these philosophers. If we think about the conception of duality, a world created by Omete Ol, the dual god, when the, dualities, when the dualities were formed, at the level of human language, this duality could be expressed in metaphors that generally consisted of two words or phrases joined to form a single idea. So, for example, flower and sun is poetry or truth. Water and hill means town. What is above and the region of the dead is the world beyond humans. In the back and in the box, is a secret. So there is a link. Human personality, poetic structures, divine foundation of the universe. Through the use of language, we are able to reach truth. In the moment when the speaker or artist truly express his or her heart in flower and song, the inner self was deified or filled with divine energy. Poetry and human personality became linked to the divine duality above. Truth, or omete all, Lord and, de and Lady and duality, could be rich through poetry, could be rich through feeling, could be rich through heart, could be rich through song. Wewet kadioli, sorry, wewet katoli, was an instrument for organizing human behavior, which was the ancient word of this god. Rhetorical orations, florid, elegant, metaphorical speech, which were memorized and presented as ceremonial occasions, that was used by those tlamatinime. The coronation of a ruler, or the entry of the yaw into the kalmekak, into the training centers or marriage, were moments in which they would uh, use rhetorics uh, to reach the divine. These words instructed on friendship, learning, aspects of beauty, worship of the gods. They were used on those ceremonies. In poems you see implied that gods befriend uh, some kind of behaviors. Then we have riddles which were part of the daily speech acts. Knowing the correct answer to riddles indicated that a person was uh, from a good family. Okay, so we come in into the last part of uh, the Aztec uh, Cosmovision. Um, we're going to talk now about the rites of renewal and uh, human sacrifice. Um, all the four pervasive themes mentioned, the traditions of Quetzalcoatl, the Great Temple, Axis Mundi, cosmology of human body, the art of language, influence the dynamics or splendid ceremonial cycles of Aztec religion, which involve different forms of sacrifice. Uh, there are two celebrations I'm going to mention. One of them is the new fire ceremony. It was celebrated once every 52 years. It was a procession of fire priests uh, with a captive uh, warrior arranged in order and uh, wearing the garb of the gods, processed out of the Noctilan toward the ceremonial center on the hill of the star. Before the ritual, the populace participated together in the ritual of extinction of fires, 
the casting of statues and hearthstones into the water and the clean sweeping of houses, patios and walkways. In anticipation of this fearful night, women were closed up in granaries to avoid their transformation into beasts who could eat them, eat men, pregnant women put on Maui masks and children were nudged awake so they did not turn into mice. It was celebrating when the night was divided in half. The new fire ceremony ensured the birth of the sun and the movement of the cosmos for another 52 years. This was achieved by the hard sacrifice of a brave captured warrior specially chosen by the king. The populace would climb over the roof of the hill of the star <clears throat> and would look with fear the possibility of the total destruction of the sun. So it was a key moment. If the fire could not be drawn, demons of darkness would descend and eat all humans. It was all in their minds. The priest would look for the appearance of the Pleiades and then a small fire was started. Then self-ear sacrifice among populace started. Then the fire was taken down the mountain and carried to Huitzilopochtli shrine. Then fire was brought to all homes. This ritual is embedded with complex meaning, astronomical, calendric, ritual theaters, human sacrifice. It is an example of world centering and world renewing. It tied together the great temple and the hill of the star. The symbology of the fire split to each house is that all lesser units of society with their local shrines are illuminated by the new fire linking of all sacred places in the Aztec world. Aztec time is also renewed. After uh, 18,980 days, all combinations of 260 days calendar and 365 days uh, calendar were exhausted. The end of this great cycle marked a point of cosmological crisis and transition. The hard sacrifice aimed at renewing the beginning of this cycle for another 52 years. So there is a renewal thanks to fire ignited at the hearth and hard sacrifice, the Teolia. Human heart, which is the Teolia, ascended to the sun and sky after death. The sun and celestial dynamics of time was being re renewed from the gift of the Teolia that was being returned to the divine beings above. So this is the first uh, festival I'm going to mention. The second one is called Tox Toxcal, the festival of Tezcatlipoca. Human sacrifice was a ritual practiced, uh, ritual practice happening every month. Toxcal was celebrated in honor of the god of the gods, Tezcatlipoca, lord of the smoking mirror, one of the four creators, the four uh, creator go gods who ordered the cosmos. Another one being Quetzalcoatl. The central act was to sacrifice a warrior chosen for his perfect physical features. This youth was ritually changed into a teot, teotl isiptla, or image of the god, who paraded for one year throughout the Aztec city. At the end of the year, this impersonator of Tezcatlipoca was sacrificed on top of the pyramid temple, when his heart was extracted and offered to the sun. The impersonator was beheaded and his skull displayed on the school rack in the ceremonial courtyard. Physical appearance was very important to be chosen. Uh, physical appearance was very important to be chosen uh, to be the one sacrificed. The perfect container of divine energy is being chosen in recognition of Tezcatlipoca's status as a high god. He then was trained in flower carrying flute playing, speech art, and whistle blowing. Then for one year is free to move around the city and supported by train guard uh, carries the living image of the god. Then he is given four wives who are impersonating goddesses of agriculture with whom he had orgiastic sexual relationships for 20 days. Then he was prepared for sacrifice. Then he was visiting four ceremonial precincts or temples, distributing food and gifts to the commoners before leaving the wives to go to the temple of Tlacocalco. We see in the ritual the integration of a number of major elements of Aztec religion. The sacrificial victim is a captured warrior, as in the case of the mythical sacrifice at Coatepec. 
because the impersonator is Tezcat Lipoca, the Tonai embedded in the school of the perfect warrior is also offered as a gift to the god. We have the importance of artistic display in the, display in the music, costume, rhetoric and poise of Tezcat Lipoca. He is a living example of flower and song, the divine truth on earth. We see the Aztec conception of the perfect life and ideal death of the warrior display for all to see as he parades, sings, plays music and is sacrificed in public. Some victims, I mean, some victims surrounded it. Uh, they surrounded it willingly, uh, even with courageous displays of devotion to the sacrificial destiny. But these were just few cases. Others did try to escape or fainted while climbing up the stairs. Women being sacrificed did not even know, in some occasions, what was their final destiny. The ones that accepted believed that the hearts and minds would, like Quetzalcoatl, be transformed into eternal forces living in the heavens. So we pass it now to speak about Mayan, re uh, Mayan re religion and about some of the, their concepts like the cosmic trees, the sacred kings, and the underworld. In Palenque, we find the sarcophagus, uh, sarcophagus lid of the Lord Pakal, which consisted of a fantastic tree decorated with jewels, mirrors, bloodletting balls, dragons, bones, and a celestial bird on the top. We have the image of Pakal at his death in that lid. The gaping jaws of the underworld which are two huge skeletal dragons joined at the chin to form a U-shaped opening representing the passage to Shibalba, and we find also five or six victims sacrificed for the funeral. This is a, you know, this is a curving lid what we find that we find in the sarcophagus of the Lord Pakal at uh, Palenque. For the Maya, the world was complex and awesome, and an awesome place, alive with sacred power. This power was part of a landscape, of the fabric of space and time, of things both living and inanimate, and of the forces of nature. Sacred beings moved between the three levels of the cosmos, the overworld, the earth, and the underworld. Shibalba was the force which was the, for the source of disease and death. The king acted as a transformer, through whom, in ritual acts, the unspeakable power of the supernatural pass into the life of mortal men and their works. Very similar to what we've been speaking up until now. The king was also sacred. The sacred wall of the Maya was centered on the flowering cosmic tree and the lives of royal families and the intimate ties to ancestors. Various, various, sorry, various means of sacrifice and mythical and spiritual journeys through the underworld revitalize, uh, renew the Maya cosmos. The Maya believed that it was possible through, a, through cosmo-magical struggles to overcome death and, ex, and to experience a spiritual future including return visits to the earthly level. The Maya was a society dedicated to warfare and public human sacrifice under the direction of a royal family involved in the investiture of a prince into the line of succession on to the sacred royal throne. They lived in socially stratified societies, especially organized around monumental ceremonial centers directed by sacred priesthoods who shared immense power with royal families in whom the ultimate authority on earth resided. Moving to the next slide. The cosmic tree is one cosmic symbol organizing and renewing the Maya, the Maya world. The Maya shaped an agricultural mentality, that is, they were deeply committed to the continual regeneration of the plant world. Agriculture is not just a profane skill. It deals with powers and life forces that dwell in the seeds, furrows, rains, and sunshine. Human society and agriculture are set within an 
are set within and dependent upon the dramatic and tense cosmic cycles that ensure the vital process of plant fertilization, ripening, harvest, decay, death and rebirth. The whole cycle. Forces in plants as sacred forces which reveal in dramatic and critical moments. An entire cosmos depended on various processes or, or rebirth. Pervasive powers of an agricultural mentality in the names and attributes of certain Maya gods. In the Popol Vuh, the cosmos is created on an agricultural style. At the beginning of time, the gods created an abundant wall of vegetation after they asked about the sky earth. The cosmic sowing and dawning provided the model, the model for, a subsequent cre for, subse for all subsequent uh, creations, innovation and innovations and changes. In Maya mythology, seeds are sown in the earth to dawn as plants. Celestial bodies are sown beneath the earth to dawn in the rising, and the dead are sown in the underworld to dawn as sparks of light in the darkness. The world's first dawn brought forth through the sun's rays, emerges with the appearance of the planet Venus. That is the Mayan theory of creation. The world is in a continual process of sowing and dawning. The Maya conceived of this process as a long performance, which hopefully would never end. Pattern of birth, death and rebirth is a worldwide pattern of religious symbolism in which the cosmos is likened to a cosmic tree or some form of vegetation. Cosmic tree means the world as a living totality, periodically regenerating itself and, because of the regeneration, continually fruitful, rich and inexhaustible. An entire terrestrial level is viewed as a tree or maize plant that repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly sprouts, blossoms, wilts, dies and is reborn. The modern Sutukhil Maya mythology states that existed a god in the form of a tree before creation began. This tree stood in the center of chaos. This god tree became pregnant and with potential life as the creation of the universe approached. It began to flower and grew in the form of fruit, one of everything that was to exist in the created world. The Maya tree, typically as in this case, is rooted in the underworld, has its trunk in the middle world and its high branches or top ascending into heaven or the upper world. The idea of the tree united through a vertical column, the cosmos and its diverse powers, forces, deities and dangers. The souls ascend and descend along the axis provided by the tree. So you have here the axis mundi from which it flows, you know, is interconnecting the three levels. The tree has a supernatural bird perch on top of uh, on the top, uh, symbolizing the celestial realm of the universe. As an example, we can mention Palenque. In Pakal's sarcophagus lid, the entire scene is in motion. Pakal is pictured at the moment of his fall into the underworld. The sun is sinking below the horizon, the horizon, and the tree is alive and it's uh, with its miraculous energies and beings. This dynamic motion is also present in the ancestral portraits curved on the side of the sarcophagus. Pakal's ancestors are depicted as emerging with a fruit tree from a crack in the earth, signifying the complementary action of dying and rising, the sen and ascent. The sen and ascent. There is a tie between agriculture and humans uh, signify when the tree is transformed into a flowering flowering corn plant. However, instead of producing ears of corn, the plant creates the heads of young males, which rest on the leaves. For in Maya thought, 
the beauty of young males may symbolize the ripe of males, which may in turn, in turn, represent the young male ruler ascending or sprouting to the throne. We have the pattern of corn and rebirth. As Amaya thought about the meaning of the sun as a divine regenerative force, the sun deity is the major symbol connecting ideas of order, verticality, heat, light, maleness, age and renewal. This is also found in other cultures, uh, that connection between the sun and maleness. As we said, we have the king as uh, being divine, being sacred. So we have the king considered uh, the human axis mundi of the Maya world, the center, you know, the human uh, center of the world. The highest expression of human sacrality in the Maya world was in the royal families and especially the supreme rulers who descended from sacred lineages. Not only did their bodies contain divine fire and energy, but their clothes, bloodiness, uh, paraphernalia, and especially their ritual actions uh, brought the divine into the terrestrial level of existence. Very similar to Egyptian religion and uh, uh, the pharaohs uh, um, believed to be uh, divine entities uh, connecting the divine world with the, with the human world. Uh, kings and rulers were the center of everything in heaven and earth. They were the living axis mundi, the embodiment of tradition and the symbol of totality. The rulers are at the center of an ecological complex consisting of five dimensions of society, the cultivation of the natural environment, the movements and lifestyles of the human population, the development of technology, conflict and warfare, and developments of social status and uh, structure. The sources of authority to carry out the immense power of kinship were the cosmic beings and especially ancestors. So ancestors' connection to the divine um, explain uh, the sacrality of uh, kinship. The power of the ruler is based on a powerful cosmic order per made, uh, at every level and dimension of the world. They suck in every, every level and dimension of the world. A human society a microcosm to copy cosmic order constructed by the gods. Sacred kings a role to align the social world of the humans with the supernatural world of the gods. And king uh, to demonstrate through ritual his line of descendant from the first ancestor uh, who was the source of sacrality. So these are the, this is uh, the base of uh, king's power. As I said, uh, dressing was very important, especially about Maya kings. The Maya culture tends to maintain regional centers of power such as Palenque, Yaxilan, Copan and Kiriwa. The result, was, the result of that was a series of powerful local and original rulers in periodic competition uh, with other city-states. The supernatural and the king became closely identified, uh, maybe in relation to this, and the Maya rulers or great sun lords were sacred, in part because of their clothing. Once arrayed with these uh, prestigious and potent objects, they hardly appeared human at all. They represented a sacred presence organized by cosmic symbols of uh, very high status. Embedded in their costumes were images of myths, gods, and spatial domains. One of the ideas of the dress is that the powers of supernatural entities uh, reside in the chest as well as the head of the king. An apron with a royal symbol of the cosmic tree signifies that the king, like the symbolic tree, was the center of the Maya cosmos. So, you know, like important objects you would find on these parts of the body. Um... Okay, so we move into the next uh, to the next slide, and we're gonna talk about regeneration, about uh, human sacrifice, self sacrifice. The king, like the flowering tree, is the central human image whose actions renew the world in ritual. The main ritual action that gave new life to the gods and agriculture was bloodletting. Two important concepts to understand uh, to understand uh, uh, bloodletting are reciprocity and rites of passage. Reciprocity established by the Maya gods during their struggle to create human beings and rites of package was a rites of passage 
sorry, was uh, what Mayas do in order to periodically renew their relationship with the forces that created them. So, reciprocity. God humans, God's humans uh, relationship was based on some form of mutual care and nurturance. The gods created humans who were in depth with them. The ongoing existence of human life depended on the generous gifts of life, which the gods continue to dispense through children, germination, rain, sunshine, the supply of animals and objects of power, you know, like everything that gave nature was given by the gods. But the gods also depended on humans to care, nurture, acknowledge and renew their powers. The world was created as a great ritual action. The, create, the creation is likened to planting and sprouting or sowing and downing. Things were brought to light. A divine society made up of immensely powerful enlightening beings who made everything. The world was created by the retelling and the doing. You know, so the world needs to be regenerated, continually regenerated. And that can be done through the retelling of the stories and through the doing of ceremonial uh, ritual practices. In this primordial stillness, the gods in the sky and the bearers, begetters, are in the water. A glittering light speak and plan for the dawn of life. How should it be shown? How should it be done? Everything is created right for humans, for which creation reciprocity might, might be required. They needed beings that praised, respected, and provided for the gods. The form of, uh, this form of praising, of respecting, were the rites of passage, which is the second important uh, concept I mentioned. A category of uh, rituals that mark the passage of a person through the life cycle from one stage to another over time, from one role or social position to another, integrating the human and cultural experiences with biological destiny, birth, reproduction and death. These rituals enable the individual to make a significant passage through a direct experience of the sacred and through learning about the human-divine relationship as defined by a particular culture. Maya society, rites of passage for all members of society at birth, poverty, uh, puberty, uh, marriage, at significant moments in the agricultural year, on becoming a warrior, a priest, or dead, this was important moments you had to, to go through these rites of, rites of passage. Within the rite of passage to the accession of the, uh, to the throne, bloodletting aim at the passage of ancestors and supernatural beings into the world of the human. The opening of passage was the wound, the wound, the wound in the human body and blood. Bloodletting was a reciprocal act. The Maya gave blood in order to receive a vision in which the gods and ancestors appeared in the wall of the ceremonial center and in order to per perceive the spiritual presence of uh, their ancestors. So bloodletting was not strange. It was described in the mythology of vari various communities, part of the, ritual, the public rituals of everyday life and central, to the, and central to the ritual actions of the upper classes. It has been called mortar of Maya life because it, it not only signaled major transition, it also integrated the levels of the cosmos and the social groups into a sense of wholeness. To understand the bloodletting, uh, we can look at the meaning, uh, the meaning of religious uh, Sorry, the religious meaning of female blood examples of Jaxilan uh, site. Female blood shed in this sacrificial manner opens the membrane between heaven and earth through which flow astronomical influences, the spirit of ancestors and legitimate power for a ruler ascending uh, the throne. 
Gods also sacrifice their own blood and in some cases bleed their genitals to stimulate visions. So, you know, you're losing blood, you, you know, you might, it's like kind of like you having, you know, you having some drugs or, you know, you drink alcohol, you know, it's, you know, by, by losing blood, you might have visions and uh, it was believed that by having those visions, you would, you know, you would be able to, to experience a, a mythical time, you know, perforing the appendix. A god is having a vision in the form of a vision serpent who spits out the sun, while another serpent in the same vision spits out the water of the underworld. The god's blood-letting vision is thus the whole cosmos. Royal penis perforated for visions My mean, you know, at least uh, David, uh, Dr. Carrasco, the, you know, the the author of this book, uh, believed that Maya Lord sought to experience a totality, even a divine totality, by imitating the capacity of women to menstruate, bleed from their genitals, and to give birth. So if he's a male, he's able to experience a female. He's a, he's a, to, he's a total being, you know, he's a, a dual being. Maya kings are uh, believed to be mothers of the gods who give birth, brings the gods into being on a terrestrial level through bloodletting. So they become women. They give birth to divine entities. This kind of giving, pain, and generosity was one of the ultimate means to participate in a truly reciprocal relationship with divine forces. So we're moving to the next slide. Um, the calendar and the regeneration of time, the symbolism of Pakal's holding a seat when entering Shibalba in his potential for regeneration following an ordeal of traveling through Shibalba, what we see in the sarcophagus lit, as I mentioned before, um, before going to Shibalba, uh, we can talk about the sacred calendar. The calendar implies the passion or for regeneration of time and life. The Maya were deeply concerned to locate all events, especially period ending dates, within a cosmological framework designed to ensure the regeneration of life. One of the calendars was the calendar round, which covered 52 years period. It consisted of two different calendars, interlock and rotating. The first one consisted of 260 days, built up by giving one of 20 day names to each day in succession and giving one of 13 numbers to each day in succession. There was another calendar of 360 plus 5 days with 80, uh, you know, which had 18 months of 20 days plus one month of 5 days. There was another long count calendar which measured around 9 million years, which is the long count calendar I just mentioned. And uh, while the Maya marked time with sacred rituals in order to both locate themselves with the great cycle of the cosmos and to regenerate their smaller cycles of agricultural, social, and cosmic changes. The Maya added the long count to the calendar round system because they took dynastic succession to be the foundation of their society. Great lengths of time became important when remembering long chains of ancestors. So, connecting the mythic and the human world is it was behind that uh, long count calendar and uh, big uh, time, you know, measures. Um, Archaeoastronomy, which has been used to understand the Maya which is defined as the interdisciplinary study of the practice of astronomy by ancient peoples using both the written and unwritten record, uh, showed that uh, major temples, entire ceremonial centers, and the calendars uh, that guided the ritual and social life were dependent in part on astronomical events and patterns. An important concept to understand is the idea of axiality or the major orientation of a ceremonial center or building with reference to the local culture's notion of cardinal directionality. Example is Chichen Itza, which lay, a, which lay out, uh, has that the oldest part of the city is aligned to 11 to 14 degrees east of, uh, of the north, of north. 
Uh, the placement and location of buildings could have offered a splendid view uh, of summer and winter solstices uh, appearing over north and south buildings. So it was all planned. The, the pattern of Maya ceremonial architecture is an excellent example of how cosmovision, the parallelism between celestial and earthly cycles, became inscribed on the maternal wall of the ceremonial center. So we move into the next slide. We're going to talk now about the underworld. Uh, the Maya, they, uh, they call the underworld Shivalba. Um, in there, you have stances of defeating death through rituals of transformation. Pattern of death and rebirth, especially in, in the Maya world, where war, sacrifice, and short lifespan were accepted. Patterns of destiny, uh, it was like, it was part of their culture. You find the heroic uh, journey through the underworld of Shivalba. Shivalba is the place of death and the place of regenerative powers symbolized by the ancestral seeds and schools. The symbols of seeds and schools were the symbols of uh, fertility. Heroes uh, go through the ordeal of the underworld where at, uh, they attain knowledge about the mysteries of existence, the afterlife and powers of rebirth. The hero overcomes the underworld and becomes immortal is the theme in uh, Mayan culture. The Maya underworld is a, is a sarcastic replica of life on earth. In other ways, Shivalba is a landscape of awesome, dangerous beings who usually have their way. The underworld ball game of the loss of Shivalba against the twin brothers explains this, uh, uh, you know, this philosophy. This understanding of uh, the other world, the twin brothers go through an ordeal of tests and finally they learn to overcome death by trickery. The, team bro the twin brothers defeat the lords of Shibalba who ended up being sacrificed. The twin brothers triumph in the midst of an extraordinary ordeal through achieving self-knowledge and the power of transformation. They finally become the sun and the moon becoming immortal. The twin brothers learn the secrets of self-sacrifice and regeneration and ascended into the celestial levels to become a permanent pattern of renewal, a mythic model for Maya religion. That's what you find in the Popol Vuh. In the same way, Pakal descends to the underworld to become a lord of Shivalba and to transform himself into the sun, rising above the horizon, horizon, sorry, in a regular pattern, passing regularly across the heavens, giving the Maya an experience of regeneration. So we're moving now to the last part of, the, uh, of uh, this talk, which is going to talk about the new world, about Mesoamerica as a new world. We're going to talk about the colonial times and uh, what the religious creativity uh, um, which appeared with the arrival of the Spanish. Um, there is a discussion over major dimensions of religious life in, in Mesoamerica. Uh, you have a pilgrimage and syncretism as two concepts very important uh, on these uh, colonial times, on those colonial times. In each of these uh, traditions, people take special journeys to or through a sacred landscape in order to have a direct, exp direct experience and gain new knowledge of the sacred. You have wall making, wall centering, and wall renewing uh, present in the rituals. Uh, you, we're going to speak about Fiesta of Santiago, which is an example of wall renewing. Then the Huichol Peyote hunting, which is an example of wall centering. And the, the, the Day of the Death, uh, El Dia de los Muertos, which is an example of wall making. In each case, a pilgrimage of humans or spirits is central to the religious action. It is, another, it is another characteristic, uh, this syncretism, or the mixing of colonial and native beliefs. Um, the new was in reality, the new world, it was in reality oppression, dependency, starvation, disease, death for Mesoamerican natives. And that's something, a fact, that's what, that's what happened when uh, the Spanish arrived to America. The formation of new religious movements and cults and mixtures of 
Hispanic and Catholic religious meanings emerge as strategies to survive and maintain human integrity in relation to their lands and selves. That was a reaction uh, to adapt into this new context. Syncretism was a sign of important religious change taking place in a culture and the primary instrument of that change appears to be ritual and ceremonial life, just as before. The first example is the Virgin of Guadalupe, La Virgen de Guadalupe, which is one of the most beautiful examples of creative syncretism, which started two decades after Spanish arrival and have continued to our days. The Virgin of Guadalupe is, is part of a may, much larger cult of the Virgin Mary of Immaculate Conception, the Catholic concept. The cult contains pilgrimage, axis mundi, war renewal, ecstasy and syncretism all together. Native connection of Guadalupe is given to a hill named Tereyac, which in, pre, in pre-Columbial times was associated with important ceremonial routes traveled to stimulate the rain-giving mountains to release their vital waters. The cult of Guadalupe, the, of Guadalupe, while strongly Catholic in meaning, also expresses an Indian sense of sacred space and worship of a goddess and her cults. Guadalupe is special because she integrates the tensions of Indians and Spaniards, but also the tensions of Mestizos and Indians, of Spaniards and Mestizos, into one community of faith and devotion, so is integrating all. She represents the union of the country, revolution against oppressive governments. She is an Indian and a Spaniard, an Earth Mother and a Holy Mother. So it's a syncretistic example of native and European uh, religious beliefs. Another example is the peyote hunt of the Huichol Indians happening in uh, central, central Mexico. Is the journey of Wirikuta to Wirikuta, which is, at, uh, is uh, 200 miles north, is a desert in which the Huichol uh, version of a universal uh, human quest is put in place, namely the search for paradise or the original center of the world where God, human, animal and plant were at one with each other during a primordial area. This search for a total unity of communities in which all, la- all of life is reflected in two major themes. Pilgrims' transformation into living images of the first peyote pilgrims, they were gods, and the peyote plant is identified with a deer. The deer is a source for food and beauty, a magical animal who gave birth, who first, uh, who gave first uh, peyote to the peyote hunters. So again, another example of syncretic uh, uh, beliefs. And uh, another example is the Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Death, celebrated in, in, in Mexico nowadays. It is a celebration dedicated to the cult of the death. The central idea is that during this period of public and private family rituals, the living and the dead family members and friends are joined together in an atmosphere of communion and spiritual regeneration. The festival is divided into three outstanding dimensions. The preparations for the ceremonies, which are an example of wall making, the symbolism of the family altars to the dead, which is an example of wall centering, and the ceremonial feats of the dead, and a spiritual union with the dead at home and at the cemetery, which is an example of world renewal. In each household, which is the center of the cult of the dead, it is believed that the souls of the dead have taken a journey to the world beyond. The souls of good people travel a straight, a a narrow path to another world, while the souls of bad people travel a wide and labyrinthine uh, way. All souls arrive at a deep and broad river that can only be crossed with the help of a dog, which lifts the souls on his shoulders, shoulders and carries them over to the other side. What is outstanding about this celebration is the belief that one's life on earth is dependent in part on treating the dead well. So on the preparations, you have marigold flowers and decorations for the altars, tombs and at the ceremonial meals for the dead and the living. Then in the family altar, you have altars built everywhere 
but especially in households as axis mundi of the ritual and ceremonial life of the family, the altar becomes a ceremonial center where, amongst other things, are placed images and pictures. The altars in part represent with the ofrendas the body of the life-giving earth with its forces of regeneration. And then you have the communion with the dead, which are five categories of dead souls coming on different days within those five days. All the ceremonies aim at the souls of the dead reassuring the living of their continued protection and the living reassuring the dead that they will remember and nurture them in their daily lives. As I mentioned before, this is, you know, like, like very clearly, this is a, it's a night native a way of thinking, you know, like you need to take care of the gods, so the gods, they will take care of you, so you need to take care of the dead, the dead because they will take care of you. So it's, it's, it's that reciprocity I mentioned before. Then you have the fiesta of Santiago among the two, two, to, to heal Maya. This is a celebration related to agricultural fertility and renewal. The belief that humans have a responsibility for assisting in the process of enrichment by carrying out certain rituals in a correct manner. This is a way of taking care of the divine forces so they will continue to regenerate the cosmos. The meaning of this celebration is that something must be put back in terms of responsible ritual actions in order to effectively take the powers of saints and deities into one's life. For the Maya, to carry out this ritual, extraordinary sacrifices are made. The Maya say this ritual involves sacrifice in terms of the serious expense incurred by the Cofradia members, who care for, nurture and pay some of the expenses of these and other rituals. Drunkenness, which is happening uh, during those fiestas, those parties, is a passage into the sacred time of Santiago, a time marked by the theme of division of realities. The action of responsible ritual care and sacrifice is done in order to renew the cosmos. This global renewing is done by symbolically retracing the cosmic image of the center and the four quarters. So we arrive to the last slide in which we're gonna talk about the conclusions, you know, as, as you know, like ideas that we've been uh, mentioning during this talk. The study of Mesoamerican religions is the study of ceremonial centers, where people act out the dramas of their cosmovision, which outline the relations of celestial and human beings. The human body, the mountains, stars, kings, warriors, ancestors, language, building, plants, and the underworld were experienced and view it as living containers of spiritual power originating above and below the human level of existence. Ritual to make, to center or renew the cosmos in a multiplicity of ceremonial centers. Post-conquest, transformation and continuation of new types of ceremonial centers at home, at the desert, at churches, you know, is, is an effect of that native thinking. Distinctive, disti distinctive aspect on the relationship of the urban world and the primary urban region, uh, generation. The role of religion on the birth of civilization in human experience. You know, the importance of religion on the birth of urban uh, societies. In social terms, we find the role of religion in the emergence and development of hierarchical societies organized on a political and territorial basis around monumental ceremonial centers that serve as the quintessential sacred meeting point between supernatural forces and human life. Mesoamerica is seen as the study of the great artifact, the city, Mesoamerican religions today constitute one of the great fields of, for the study of social and religious change, innovation and persistence. With all new discoveries, the more modern becomes Mexico, the more it, di it discovers its, pa its past. That's what happened nowadays. 
like North American Chicanos claiming his ancestral past in, for example, Casa Atlan, which uh, is a you know, is a place that is being created by Chicanos in North America represents this world century or placing the neighborhood as if it was Athlan, a sacred place used as ceremonial center. It is a special gift of the religious imagination that allows a people after 500 years of colonialism, dependency, oppression and resistance to turn to the ancient Mesoamerican past for symbols of a cosmovision that help make a world meaningful, give it a standing center and provide for social and spiritual renewal. So I arrive uh, with these words to the end of my talk. I hope that you enjoyed uh, watching um, you can find this video and many other articles that I have written on uh, the web my website. I hope you enjoyed.